Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. I can do this with Wendy Show. She's at Brown University, and she's been to every bar, every place that sells Narragansett Lager beer in Rhode Island. And when I was 39 years old, I mean, two or three nights a week, I was at Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel. Really? And they serve they serve the Narragansett in plastic cups. Yep. I mean, Professor Schiller <laughs> knows this. this is way back. I mean, you go down to the dockside in Newport, mm-hmm. listen, you know, listen to the the blues and NRBQ and all that. Wendy, 39 years old, I'm a vice presidential nominee. Is that too young? No, I mean, I don't think it's too young. I think uh, he's navigated uh, a political career after being, you know, Yale Law School and and writing a bestseller. Uh, I don't think it's too young. I think that's one of the things that Americans are looking for, right? This big contrast between our older main candidates and the (laughs) VPs being younger. I think William Jennings Bryant would have enjoyed J.D. Vance's speech, Tom, (laughs) last night. I mean, it struck almost identical themes to 1896. I don't know if that should reassure people or make them very frightened that we're going backwards. But nonetheless, um, no, I don't think so at all. Uh, I think that he's positioning himself to be the heir apparent before Trump even wins this election. So that's an interesting political dynamic in in the Republican Party. Bill Clinton, 46 and a half. George W. Bush, Bush the Younger, 54 and a half. Mm -hmm. President Obama, 47 and a half. I guess the trend's there. We've been talking this morning, Professor Schiller, about isolationism. What's the character of the Trump Vance isolationism? Well, Trump has successfully pitched this in two ways. One is we get bad deals when we go into multi uh, multi nation agreements, um, particularly NAFTA, which he re- renegotiated, which, by the way, was triumphed by Newt Gingrich and the Republicans in the House in 1993. So I thought it was it's amazing that they just pushed this all to the Democrats. Um, it was pretty clever of them. Uh, so that's one way, right, is that we just don't get a good deal when we're part of these multi nation accords and economically we suffer. The other is in military arrangements, we end up paying most of the bills. And that's what Trump had said in 2016 through his presidency. And he's saying, again, that resonates with a lot of Americans, particularly in a time where they see that they're struggling to pay their bills because of inflation. So it's clever to bring these two issues together, uh, mostly under an economic tent. Wendy, what do we expect to hear from the former president tonight at his speech? Well, Paul, um, Donald Trump has remained more disciplined in the last you know, two months of his campaign than we've ever seen him. Uh, either as candidate or president in prior years. I mean, incredibly disciplined. So if this speech, which he gave in 2016, was, you know, I'm going to make sure we're safe from crime and I'm going to block immigrants, I think it's going to be very similar to 2016, but it might be just a little bit more moderated, just a little bit. He has squashed abortion at the Republican convention, which is really remarkable, given that it's been the driving populist force in the Republican Party for so long. So if he stays disciplined and doesn't look literally too scary to independent voters, then I think they're going to walk away and think this convention was a a big success. Uh, Let me break in here, Paul, uh, with Professor Schiller of Brown. At the European Central Bank, as expected, they leave key rates unched. They wait for signs inflation is under control. And they say that Christine Lagarde will not swim in the River Seine in Paris. <laughs> the Olympics. Wendy, it <clears throat> certainly appears to a lot of folks, including myself, that the, this has been a really solid convention for the Republican Party. How much, how much momentum do they have coming out of this? Every party, if they can pull off a successful convention, has momentum coming out. Mitt Romney had a lot of momentum coming out in 2012. Um, you know, the, the, gov- the, the government, I'm sorry, the, the public focuses on the party in that week. And if everybody looks good and sounds good, they think, hey, maybe this is the party we're going to go with. When we have incumbents 
They're bringing their priors with, uh, you know, anything that will push them away. That was the risk for the Republicans, is that they've got this energized base, more unified now from uh, lots of factors, including the, the tragic at attempt on Trump's life. So now they've got unity and energy. And, you know, did they mess it up? And they did not mess it up. And that's why I think their momentum continues. The Democrats are the exact opposite. It's starting to feel a lot like 1988 when there was a quote unquote winnable election for the Democrats and somehow they lost it. So I think the Democrats are under tremendous pressure to generate energy. And finally, I will say that that may require that Biden step aside very soon in order to give them the time to ramp up that energy for their own convention. So where are we with that? I mean, it seems like from past discussions, Wendy, that this is the decision solely on President Biden. Can he be uh, persuaded to perhaps step down or create a process for a new candidate? Well, Paul, the biggest difference between two weeks ago and now is that, you know, chief donors, not just George Clooney and The New York Times, but, you know, the people who are actually really writing a lot of checks have stopped, okay. basically freezing the money. They're not giving the money. That's trickling down to Senate and House races as well. You know, and that means the party could completely collapse. So without any money, it just strikes me that Biden doesn't have a lot of choices here. And the question is, will he directly, you know, send his delegates to Kamala Harris or send it to an open convention? Right. And I think he's still waiting to hear about that, Tom. He's still waiting to hear, right. do you have a choice? Is the party unified around Kamala? If so, then I'll get out. OK, well, maybe that's polling. How do you envision a quote unquote open convention like from this Sunday forward? What does that look like, Professor Schiller? Um, you know, if you ever imagine a political nightmare, uh, an open Democratic convention in 2024 would be that um, <laughs> because it will be it will expose the fissures and fractures within the Democratic Party um, between the very progressive left, the progressive, the middle. Um, and, you know, they won't be able to agree. They're going to want their person uh, to challenge Trump and try and make arguments about that all the way from Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, all the way down to, you know, uh, dark horses like Gina Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce, you know, and Gretchen Whitmer might be dragged back into it. Uh, Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania. It will look like the Democrats can't decide and don't know what they're doing um, and will only feed into whatever nostalgia Trump voters have for Trump, but also independent voters who want a stable system. And this is the big irony of 2024 now that Trump and Republicans appear right now to be more stable, less chaotic than Biden and the Democrats. Uh, Professor Schiller, thank you. Really appreciate it. You know, folks, I'm not big on the parlor game. I really don't care about four rate cuts, eight rate cuts, bada bee, bada ba. But what I do know is it's a lonely crew saying the consensus is wrong. I'm going to put Lindsay Piazza and Stiefel in that group, and the leadership of Jim Bianco has been profound. He absolutely nailed the challenge of the last mile of disinflation. He joins us now uh, from his Chicago. Jim, your note is seeing soon. Discuss. Yes, I don't think the Fed should be cutting soon because I don't think that the economic data is supporting a Fed rate cut. And that is, is that the slowing that you've seen in the U.S. economy might have already bottomed. It is growing at somewhere at around two and a half percent for the second quarter. That's fine. And I think that the inflation rate, while it's come down, has largely been in a 3 to 4% range for the last year and a half. It's back to 3%, the lower end of the range. And to use a fancy term, there's some residual seasonality in the data, meaning that you get all the weak inflation data in the summer. And that's what got you down to 3%. And then right. as we move into the fall, I think it stiffens up a little bit. So the Fed shouldn't cut. Right. But it looks like they're intent on cutting. So OK, but Jim, your note is inflammatory. I mean, it's really <laughs> something you've got as a, for the sake of discussion and our start set. And we're not talking two point X percent. We're not talking Richard Clarida. We're talking a Jim Bianco three or four. And you even print the number five. Is America ready for a three percent, four percent our start? Uh, America's ready for it because the economy can handle it. The financial markets can handle it. It's the economic community that's not ready for it right now. Um, if you look at the, the current level of interest rates and you listen to Fed speak, 
they talk about it being highly restrictive. It might be retarding the economic growth. And again, look at the stock market. Look at the rally in small cap stocks when we started pricing in September in the last week or so. Um, and the data is just not there. But the economists still cling to this that the neutral funds rate, which is what our star is, is two and a half percent. And put this in terms, the Fed thinks they need to cut 10 times to get to neutral. That's why they want to get started. They got a lot of work to do. The market is probably telling them, no, you probably need only about four or five cuts to get to neutral. There really isn't any hurry. Right. But if you're going to give me stimulative uh, interest rates by lowering them, then I'm going to pile into small cap stocks. And that's what we've seen in the last week. And Paul, on, on uh, YouTube live chat, they nail it. It's a Sweeney, it's a Sweeney uh, live chat. 6% cash. Yeah, I mean, that's what, maybe wrong, what Jim's talking what's about. What's wrong with that? Hey, Jim, it, it, we, we have seen that rotation into small caps. What do you make of that? Because, I mean, what I'm hearing from some of the strategists is that's a rotation like we've never seen before. Oh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I've looked at the statistics and it is unprecedented depending on how you look at it. And usually when you get a massive rotation in the small cap stocks in the past, it's because the market is literally collapsing and big cap stocks are going down faster than small cap stocks. This one is everything's going up except for yesterday and small cap stocks are going up a lot more. But I really think what it is, is that this is such a macro dependent market and that that negative point one on CPI, you know, the bell went off. That's it. The Fed's going to give us cheaper money. Let's go to all of the let's go to all of the lagging companies and let's go to all the companies that have borrowed more, and that would be in the small cap space, or have losses in the small cap space, and that that cheaper money will benefit them. So everybody started to exit large cap and rallied it, ran into small cap to a degree we've never seen before. So there is no historical precedent for what this means, like what, what does this mean a month or two months later, because we've never seen it, especially in a rally. So this is an election year, uh, Jim. How does that impact the Fed really at, at the end of the day? Well, it should, and it has in the past. And I, you know, to be very nuanced about it, the Fed has never changed direction between Memorial Day and Election Day. Changed direction. If they were hiking, they'd continue to hike. Cutting, continue to cut. Hold, they continue to hold. They're talking about changing directions in September by um, cutting rates. That is uh, uh, unusual. And the fear is that interjects themselves into the political debate because Donald Trump won't be happy. He'll say that Jay Powell's trying to rig the election against him. And then the, the Fed would prefer that their name not get mentioned between now and Election Day. And so it, it, they shouldn't be part of it. Now, what does it mean for markets? At a macro level, stocks, bonds, the dollar, I don't think you could really see the machinations in the, in the election there. But when you go further down the line, if you look at maybe the meme stock of uh, Donald DJT, um, you know, Trump media, that one goes up and down. Tesla seems to be another stock because Elon Musk is so tied himself with Donald Trump. You know, if you look at maybe the prison stocks or the body armor stocks, because there's going to be more spending on police and protection, those kind of things are moving. But not at the higher levels. Are you really seeing the, the, this election impacting the market, uh, impacting the market? Jim, what's the stock market do here? I, I mean, away from the economics and all, do you have an SPX or Dow Jones faith out 12 months well you know that you know the stock market i think is going to really take its cues from interest rates um it bottomed in september of 2022 and it's been rallying and there's only been two times when it didn't rally a 10 percent correction between june and october of last year and and march and april this year a six percent correction what was uh, what was um existed during both those corrections the 10-year yield above four and a half percent when the 10-year yield gets above 4.5%, the stock market seems to struggle. We're at 418 right now, so we're not above 4.5%. But if the market starts to feel like the Fed's going to ease, the economy's okay, this inflation problem is not solved, the rejection of that policy could be higher interest rates. And if it gets above 4.5%, that could become a problem for the stock market. Mm -hmm. So right now, I think it's going to be okay. It's just going to go through this massive rotation that we haven't seen before. And it's going to be really dependent on whether or not interest rates start to head higher. Right. And I'll conclude by saying, I ultimately think by you know the end of the year into the first quarter, they will get well above four and a half percent again. 
and it will be a problem, but they're not there right now. Jim Bianco from Chicago. Thank you so much, Bianco. Research really important comments there, uh, pushing against the Fed zeitgeist to say uh, the least. Hugh Van Steenis joins us right now. Hugh, I got to rip up the script here on ECB. We stagger from Doisenberg to Trichet on to Draghi in the modern day of Lagarde. How's that ECB exper experiment going, Hugh Van Steenis? Uh, well, great to be back with you, Tom, um, and glad I'm not swimming in the Seine at the moment, let alone in the Thames. Um, look, I think the ECB experiment has been painful. Um, you and I have chatted many times over the last... Uh, you know, uh, dozen, a dozen and a half years, really, since the euro has been introduced, um, how we've had to have a, an awful lot of emergency measures, whether it's uh, QE and TLTR, special <coughs> bank lending schemes to fend off the eurozone crisis. Then we had this dangerous experiment of negative interest rates. Finally, we're getting back to a little bit of normality, uh, even if maybe not so normal on the politics side. So I think it's been a very painful experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, you know, one of the things I put in my op-ed at the FT last week is, we still haven't finished the reforms. Um, uh, I, I went to the, I was invited somehow to the 10 year anniversary of banking union. Uh, Tom, I didn't see you there. Uh, <laughs> but the problem was it's only got one leg finished. Two, two, two parts of the house are still unfinished. And securitization in right. Europe has been basically dead as a dodo for 15 years. And so there's plenty of work still to be done. Right. I should interview him, pro uh, introduce him properly. Hugh Van Steen is vice chair of Oliver Wyman, a service to the United Kingdom with Mark Carney at the Bank of England, and of course, his endowment work with his Oxford University. Hugh Van Steen, as you sent me a chart the other day, which is your wheelhouse, which is trying to keep track of the shadows to come in banking. And this is mm. always about highest quality tranches unloading the garbage of lower quality tranches to somebody else. Who's the somebody else this time around? It's a great question, Tom. So I think that the, the challenge here is it's, 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 there's no simple picture. So if you take, let's say, our friends at uh, Apollo or Blackstone working with their insurance colleagues, well, insurance companies need investment grade. If they can just get even 50 basis points more than their competitors over a decade to 12 years. That's huge. So in their case, they're really wanting high quality investment grade assets. Clearly, if you're gonna get 12 to 15 points of return, you're gonna to need to be taking a lot more risk. And so there's some endowments, pension funds, and increasingly right. high net worth, or maybe reaching down. But there is no, the challenge here is there's not a great data set. And that's in a way why BlackRock bought, you know, the, that big right. data company recently. But also it's more complex. I mean, I'm not, Look, credit is credit. There is a site. There'll be a cycle. There's always stuff which goes wrong. So I'm not going to be um, panglossian that there won't be problems. But on the other hand, I don't see that this is. I don't think there's any reason to panic. Hugh, you just you referenced your op-ed in the Financial Times back uh, about 11 days ago. And you, in that, you say Europe's capital markets are underdeveloped, while its banking sector is insufficiently sized to handle the growing demands for capital expenditures tied to energy transition, digital infrastructure, defense. Is there a solution there? I mean, what is the solution? Uh, look, I think it's a great point. So um, Europe relies far, far more on the banks. So point one, I would be in favor of trying to, you know, have interesting investment opportunities, which fixed income investors around the world or equity ones would want to come and uh, seize. So I think part one is making it easier to list, having a more standardization in the bond markets. And in the piece, I was particularly saying securitizations have really not rebounded since the financial crisis. The way the Europeans codified that closed the, the, the door after the financial crisis was incredibly penal and therefore it's never restarted. And I think that's that allowing banks to package loans and parcel them on to investors is actually a really smart way to help us through Europe, Europe's growth. So I, I think reopening securitizations there. In the next um, two weeks, we might see the Draghi report published. And certainly what my sense of that is that he's going to be also arguing to try and, you know, dust off the plan to, to, to reopen securitizations. But it's more than just that. I mean, you know, whether right. it's, you know, how the US election is going, Europe will need to spend more on defense. It'll need to spend more on right. energy security, let alone transition. And of course, upgrading its right. digital infrastructure. These are vast sums. And I don't think the banking system alone is big enough right. and strong enough 
And Draghi himself in uh, Portugal the other day said he didn't think Europe's banks were, right. were had enough capacity. I mean, you know, this is important. Bruce Kasman publishing moments ago, folks, at J.P. Morgan, uh, and he just says global disinflation to continue in the second half of this year. What does disinflation mean, Hugh von Steen, as to the financial system? It's constructed as a good. I don't buy it. There's an ambiguity. So it depends which which bit of disinflation we're talking about here. If it's sort of if it's Chinese exports impacting Europe, that's one thing. If it, de it depends where we, we're going. I mean, as we're seeing from the ECB today, there's not massive disinflation. There's quite frankly still inflationary pressures in the system. Um, but at the end of the day, banks are levered plays on growth. And what we've seen is very, whilst loan growth in the last bank lending survey has picked up a little bit, it's still really low. I mean, in the last decade, bank loan growth in Europe has been half that in the States. And that's because Europe has not been growing as far. So I think that disinflation and the pressures on exports for Germany, the pressures on, uh, on growth in France, these are ones which will be challenging. But what, what, where, let, let's, be, let's be clear, for every problem there's a solution. In my conversations with bank CEOs and CFOs, they are looking to, lo to optimize their balance sheets. The reason why they're, in, they're partnering up with private credit, only this morning we saw Lloyds, the number one bank in the UK, partnering up with Oak Tree, part of Brookfield, is because they want to try and you know, free up some capital to offer dividends and buybacks. Yeah. So look, for every problem, there's a solution. And I think that's yeah. why the private credit trade in Europe is actually still quite interesting. Yvonne Sinas, thank you so much with Oliver Wyman. I can't say enough. The front page is Elisa Mateo. We start strong with a Paul Sweeney nugget. I saw this, Paul. Oh, yeah. I said, are you kidding me? Lisa, discuss. <laughs> All right, the Warner Brothers, apparently they they need to boost their share price, right? So they may be looking to split its digital streaming and studio business from its TV network. So this is from the Financial Times. They're saying CEO David Zaslav looking into a few options from selling the assets to actually, yes, splitting off its Warner Brothers movie studio and that Mac streaming service into a new company. Um, they haven't hired an investment bank or anything like that, but it's top manager reportedly talking to advisors. But I mean, the whole thing is about, I guess, boosting the share price. Yeah, and really it, you know, think about Warner Brothers Discovery, they have two very interesting uh, big investors. One is cable billionaire John Malone, and the other one is the Newhouse family, which c controls Condé Nast. Very, very smart media folks there. Yes. And they know where the value is, and the value is probably okay, in the streaming businesses, not necessarily in some of the legacy uh, networks. Uh, in our vast offices here, the surveillance offices, I sat 15 feet that way the day Chrysler ran over the bondholders. <laughs> and I'm sorry, the FT explains yep. this beautifully. They do. Folks, what they're gonna do is take the gazillions of debt and put it into the news division as they wander off with Sweeney's streaming company. Mm -hmm. Paul, you gotta be kidding me. In this day and age, they're gonna get away with that with bondholders? I holders? don't know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, the, it's interesting. They have so much debt on this company that they have to put the debt where the cash flow is um, to support the debt, so we'll see. But again, this is a typical, I, it's such a typical deal. I, I, I'm already envisioning the pitch book because that I would have put together to go to the board to go to the management here. Um, it's just right out of the central casting of it is. You know, of M and A, uh, you know, divestiture. But are those up. times still in play? That's well, I think I, for I the wonder people, the I, rules of the road has changed. I mean, they may have, but boy, look at the the principles here again. John Malone, the Condé Nast, uh, David Zasloff, the CEO. Um, this is in their wheelhouse. They think about these things. Okay, you know, where's yeah, the value but, but, where, and what can support the debt? So we'll see. Okay, so I, I got it. I can bring it up on the Bloomberg. I got $42 billion in debt. Yep. And they're going to they're gonna give that? They're going to hand that to Wolf Blitzer? Yes, exactly. We'll see. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Margaret Brennan. Here, yep. Margaret, you take $10 billion in debt. And Wolf, you take $32 billion in debt? Sure. And that's what we're talking about. And there's $10 billion of EBITDA to support that. So it's about four times net debt to EBITDA. Um, that's okay. It's not crushing, um, they, but um, it, it's 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 tough. They were at fifty-two billion in debt just a couple of years ago, so they are yeah. paying it down. They've got five billion dollars yeah. a year in free cash flow. There is stuff there to build on, but I'll leave it to we'll Lisa. We'll get Rich Greenfield and Moffat Nathanson yes. and the rest. We'll get the adults in here to exactly. describe this. Maybe Mario Gabelli.
Okay, no, I'm sorry, Lisa. We get carried away on that. What else? No, do you it's have? good. It's good. Another deal. Okay, this is for the WNBA. Um, apparently, the framework is set. The new media rights deal with Disney, NBC, Amazon. <laughs> It was first reported by The Athletic. The Wall Street Journal confirmed the numbers. The league set to bring in approximately $2.2 billion over 11 years. Um, now, if you break down the numbers, so the WNBA's current media rights valued at about $60 million per year. This new structure would be in the annual range of $200 million. So you see still the low. difference. Still, still low. Right, right. In my, that's in the my thing. opinion, still low. I mean, we're talking about the, I there's would not so much lock excitement up that long. behind the WNBA. Yeah, if I were the WNBA, I would not lock up for this long. I think, uh, okay. um, I think I think they're at the, really at the cusp of this. Caitlin Clark and all the other great yes. young players into the league. This It's everywhere. You go to ESPN.com, you pull up the app, you get the N- WNBA stuff before you get like Major League Baseball. And, and that's how they rank it. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So if I were the WNBA, I'd go short here on my deal. But that's just okay. What do you got next? Um, Citadel founder Kenneth Griffin. Yes, he apparently has a thing for collectibles. So he set a record for a fossil sold at auction. He paid forty-four point six million dollars at Sotheby's for a one hundred and fifty million year old stegosaurus. Its name is Apex. It's about 11 feet tall. It was found in Colorado. Oh. It was actually expected to get six million, but he paid 45 sure, million for it. Um, some people say he wants to lend it to a U.S. museum, but I mean, he's done these trophy pieces before. Okay. Um, but this is just just go buy a sports a big, team. <laughs> I guess he likes buying. All right. Our, well, that's cool if he, gives, if he donates it to a museum no, so a- everybody. A- can ABC see it. has. A Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's the that's the mean one. Okay. The big, yes. You know, in the yep. movies. The meat eater. Its yes. nickname <laughs> was Stan, and it sold for thirty one million okay. four years ago. Thank you, ABC, for that. <laughs> I made a joke about Legos. I mean, yeah. The kids are, the kids are all into it, and then it's over. Then they yeah. move on. <laughs> right. You know. Done it's it. a well, Stegosaurus. Yeah. There's one, and I think it's in England. I can't remember. There's one that's very cool. It's, it's like the, in a museum, and it's, it's like, got the. Bumps on the back or something like that. Oh, you're sorry. nailing it, Paul. Yeah, I'm nailing it. You're just killing, just killing it. it. Like, Take it back to my <laughs> geology <laughs> yes, with Paul. Exactly. Duke University. <laughs> Lisa, save us. Okay, the last one. This one's for the kids. Yes, you it talked does. about Legos and stuff. Okay, uh, this is a new Beanie Baby. If you've heard about it, you know Beanie Babies kind of faded after oh, yeah, a while. Oh yeah, it's a big deal though. But yeah. it is a big deal. So now they have something called a Beanie Bouncer. It's this little four inch toy and you can bounce it. It has a ball inside and it goes about 50 feet high. So the kids are going to wreck havoc inside your house with this. Exactly. <laughs> so you got to take Who it outside. Oh, I see it. Okay. Take it outside, okay? But um, they're saying that it, it's got the patents for it. It's going along with the patents. It comes in like 12 animal characters. But this could be the hot new thing at Christmas. Remember the Who rubber knows? ball that you slammed on the driveway mm-hmm. and you tried to get it to go over the house? <laughs> Which you did four or five times <laughs> until a second floor window went out. Or got stuck the in a fun gutter. Part. But it's good. You get the kids outside. So you get them off the technology all get right. them outside. I'm all for that. <laughs> do your kids go outside? Uh, they do because they're forced to. I mean, they have sports every day. They're outside for hours at a time. It's a huge deal. But it's you do. You have to get them off. Of, I yeah. remember when they were little, like getting them off the devices and getting them outside. Got to yeah. do it. That's, it's difficult. Okay, well, thank you, Lisa. Is that it? You, got, you have one quick That's one it. You know, that there was one fun. about alcohol being bad for your health, but that was in the journal, but I think no, that, totally that wouldn't, go, that. Over, yeah, that wouldn't go over very well here. You know, Not I said, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I said, nah, we'll pass on that. Next. <laughs> this is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.